Welcome everybody. I do hope you hear me now. Uh, and uh, I would like to start by welcoming the first speaker, which is uh, a representative of today's sponsor, which is Höjberg Patent Firm. And with us today, we have Jens Victor Nörgard, partner and head of biotechnology and plant sciences and European patent attorney at Höjberg. I hope here we have Jens. See if we Thank can you very much, that. and I'll try and share my screen again. Yes, there we go. Welcome, yes. Now, here we go. That's much better. Thank you very much, and uh, sorry for this uh, technical uh, interruption. Uh, so, uh, I'm from Heubeck. We're patent attorneys, uh, and we work with inter alia with patenting of drug formulations. And as Anna said uh, previously, sometimes you have an impossible molecule and impossible concentrations and impossible conditions. And that's where the drug formulation kicks in. And this, of course, can also be patented. So this is just a slide of me. We're Heuberg. We're a life science focused patent law firm located in different locations in the American Valley region and also in uh, Stockholm and Aarhus. Uh, basically, you can patent a lot of things around drugs. The drug, of course, the molecule is, is in the center of that. Around that, you can have a drug formulation. You can have uh, upstream methods for manufacturing and characterizing your drug. And you can also patent users of the drug. Today, we're focusing on the formulations. These are very important when it comes to uh, commercial value, because very often you will have a situation like in this slide, we are in 2020, we have a projected market entry in 2027. This is, uh, is an, an orphan drug. You get data protection in the EU, orphan drug designation, also data exclusivity and orphan drug designation in the US. But very often your first patent on the drug has already expired once you get on the market and has limited value protecting you against generic competition once the exclusivities have expired from the uh, regulatory authorities. And this is where your formulation patent kicks in. If you're so lucky that you can find that at a late stage, stage it will protect your drug beyond the expiry of your um, regulatory exclusivities. <clears throat> so what does it require to get a patent on a drug formulation? Well, if you have a situation like described with the impossible molecule and the other impossibilities, <clears throat> there needs to be some technical effect. It could be just a patient benefit, uh, whatever that is, benefit to the patient. Could be BK, reduction of side effects, it could be efficacy. It could also be uh, effects relating to the way that you actually manufacture the uh, drug formulation. It could be drug stability, formulation stability. If you have anything like that, it would be possible to protect it in a patent and hence extend the protection for your drug product. It gives an extension of the uh, effective patent term for your market formulation and it's not limited to any particular use. So that was all I'm going to say today. I am very sorry that we are not able to bring our usual uh, Heuberg candy to this network meeting. And uh, we're hoping for, for uh, ease of restrictions uh, sometime next year so we can start sharing our candies again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jens. Uh, um, the candy is great, but uh, this information is indeed more valuable in the long run. So. Uh, this was what we needed now. Um, thank you for a really brief but uh, good cover about the value of uh, drug delivery also from an assets point of view. And now we're turning to one of the representatives from the pharmaceutical um, uh, industry uh, today. I would like to introduce Jonas Johansson, Director of Science and Innovation at AstraZeneca and also the leading force behind uh, one of the co-hosts today, which is Sweden Drug Delivery Industry Group. Jonas will both introduce us to the network, SDDIG, and give us a picture from AstraZeneca of the challenges with various actives, vehicles, and administrations. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, Let's see now. Share my screen. Um, I hope you can. 
can see this. Yes, there we go. Please, Jonas. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Petra and Sofia, for, for making this possible, for, for having uh, uh, for having me here and allowing me to talk about uh, drug delivery. Um, I will actually give you two presentations in, in probably eight minutes or something. So first I will say something about uh, the Sweden Drug Delivery Industry Group and then I will turn to, to drug delivery at AstraZeneca. So let's go then. It's, um, it's almost exactly five years since uh, a number of, a number of uh, companies, about 10, 10 companies in Sweden involved in drug delivery met and we discussed drug delivery and, and challenges. And we all agreed that smart drug delivery uh, can be used in different ways with different values to improve efficacy, to, to get a better uh, safety profile and to improve um, patient adherence. But we also agreed that uh, there is little awareness of, of the value of drug delivery. So we uh, uh, shortly after that, we, we decided to form Sweden Drug Delivery Industry Group. And this has now grown uh, quite a lot since then. Uh, our agreed vision then was to for Sweden to become uh, among the top countries in the world in generating value from drug delivery, underpinning an innovative and competitive life science industry. And when you read this, uh, you should understand Sweden as now uh, the re this region, because drug delivery doesn't really know any any boundaries. So this region to be be among the top uh, regions in the world. And we also have a mission that is uh, threefold. So the first is uh, to communicate uh, the value of drug delivery and influence stakeholders. The second is to collaborate and create a uh, vibrant drug delivery environment in Sweden. And, and this is what we do today. We, we collaborate and we talk about drug delivery in this region. And the third is uh, to support initiatives on drug delivery value creation. And we have been operating now for five years and a lot of things have happened. We see that, uh, that uh, people in life science now talk a lot more about drug delivery. The, uh, drug delivery. And we have seen at least three different uh, uh, science initiatives in this area coming up and, and flourishing. So something is really happening here. Um, Sweden Drug Delivery Industry Group is, is an informal group. So uh, we meet because we think we have something to talk about. Uh, we don't really have, a, we're not an official body, we don't have a budget, we don't have a web page, but we do have a LinkedIn page that you can go to. So if you're interested in drug delivery, you can uh, uh, check that address there to the left, or you can just go to LinkedIn and search for Sweden Drug Delivery Industry Group, and then you can become a member of this page. If you have any drug delivery related information that you want to share, you can post it as, as a member of this group and you can read about uh, other, other information from other parties uh, interested in drug delivery. So, so please uh, look at this page and see if you can add to the discussion of drug delivery. We, uh, yep. Um, we have a number of uh, member companies. Uh, this is now a year or a year and a half old, so we haven't I haven't been able to have the last uh, uh, companies here. But uh, we are uh, on the order of thirty to thirty-five company member companies uh, in uh, Sweden Drug Delivery Industry Group, and it's it's still growing. But now we turn our emphasis more towards other organisations. So not just the, the member companies, but also we reach out to organizations such as uh, Medicon Valley Alliance, which is a very important step for us because as I said, uh, drug delivery doesn't know any boundaries. Uh, we now want to go into a phase where we collaborate much more widely. So let's switch gears then. As Anna said, I'm a director of science and innovation uh, working for, for um, AstraZeneca. That means that I scout for new opportunities. Uh, uh, I have uh, different areas of, uh, the, of interest. So one is uh, characterization and analytics, and the other is uh, drug delivery. I 
just want to share a couple of slides about uh, what's going on. Um, so in the last few years, we have seen a, a tremendous shift in interest, a, a paradigm shift of people often talk about in, in the pharmaceutical industry. So in the old days, if you like, uh, we used to, to work with the small synthetic molecules and also work with the uh, large proteins, um, monoclonal antibodies, etc. And now, since a few years back, we see a tremendous increase in the different type of, of drug modalities that, that we use. Uh, we have seen things such as um, oligonucleotides. We have been using uh, antisense oligonucleotides to, to downregulate a particular mechanism uh, related to a particular disease. We start to see more of a um, new uh, conjunction uh, mechanisms. So where, where, we, um, where we connect different types of or different molecular moieties, uh, such as if you, if you take uh, and connect a, a tumor seeking agent to uh, a warhead uh, against a particular cancer. Uh, and then when, when you do that, you need a, a certain linker library because th that's also part of it. So here I have an example here, Protax, which is then, it's a small molecule, but still it has this uh, uh, connected uh, functionalities. We see very complex uh, 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 mechanisms as well. We, we use, for instance, uh, RNA. So you can have uh, sRNA or mRNA or microRNA. We work a lot with the modified mRNA. And here the, the challenges are, are incredibly uh, large because we have a large molecule where we want to target uh, intercellular mechanisms. So if we go to, to this slide then, we can divide up the, the, the world in, in simple APIs and complex APIs. You can also look at it from the formulation perspective, uh, simple formulations versus complex formulations. And the, the, the cross section to, to, the, to the left there, maybe I should do like this actually. So th this part of the world is probably not interesting for us, uh, simple APIs and, and simple formulations. But also simple APIs can, can require quite complex formulations. So when we, we have, for instance, a, a very uh, poorly soluble compounds, we need to be clever about the formulation. We will probably want to develop some sort of a nano uh, particle formulation of some kind. And there are lots of different opportunities here. Uh, on the opposite, we may have a complex API where we can still get away with the, a fairly simple formulation, which is often the case in, in, with the oligonucleotides where, where we can often get away with, with a, a simple injection solution. Then it can become really complicated when we have a complex API that requires a complex formulation, such as with the case with the mRNA. So here we need to, here we target, uh, our target sits inside the cell. This is a large molecule that we have to get across the, the cell membrane. First of all, it has to be a, a stable formulation that we can provide, that we can give to, to a patient. It has to be taken up through the cellular membrane. So we have to find the right port through the cellular membrane. And still we mustn't trigger immune uh, reactions. And then once inside the cell, it has to be released to the, to the cytosol. And then it still has to be active and, uh, and generate this uh, uh, protein, uh, start this protein factory. So tremendous challenges here for, for everyone. And also we may have something about uh, a challenge about uh, devices that can, that can add, also those can add value in, in the drug delivery context. And uh, this is where we're also, so plenty of opportunities for everybody here. We, will, we have a lot of uh, challenges for the future. And uh, this is basically where we are. I think my time is up now. So Anna. Yeah. Let's see if I can stop sharing maybe. Yes, thank you so much, Jonas. Um, don't worry, you're exactly on time. And uh, 
super interesting with the, the diversity that you, you illustrate so well and uh, how we hear you talk about complexity and opportunity in the same sentence. I think that is a, very much a takeaway message. A lot of things to be done, uh, a lot of opportunities uh, for everybody. So uh, thank you very much, Jonas. We will hear more from you later on in the, in the panel. Now uh, we will move back to the drug develop, product development and we are moving to Ferring. Uh, I know you too, just like AstraZeneca, work with uh, many modalities and uh, need to incorporate these with the latest in drug delivery. So uh, it's going to be really fun to listen to uh, Andreas Huget. Welcome, you are a senior scientist and at the product development and drug delivery group at Fedding. So please, Andreas, if you are with me, yes, here you are. You can try to share your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, can you confirm that you see my screen? Uh, now I do. Okay, excellent. Uh, so I'll present an overview of the drug delivery development at uh, Faring Pharmaceuticals. And um, Faring, uh, we are a mid-sized uh, biopharmaceutical company, and we are engaged in a number of different therapeutic areas, such as reproductive medicine and maternal health, urology and, and gastroenterology. Now, uh, um, as Esther pointed out, there are a lot of different drug modalities and, and also Farron is engaged both in our drug products on the market and, and also in, in the pipeline with a number of different drug modalities. Um, and uh, with these different modalities comes, of course, complexity, because uh, these are not only different in, in size, but also different in, in the physiochemical characterization and analytical characterization that needs to be done um, and uh, needs to be employed. And we encompass everything from the very small to the uh, extremely large molecules uh, in our pipeline and marketed products. Now, <clears throat> having all these different modalities and being a mid-sized company, then uh, we need to handle a lot of different administration routes and a lot of different uh, uh, dosage forms as well. And dosage forms can be quite diverse, ranging from intravesical for gene delivery to uh, oral dosage forms of small molecules or uh, enemas, transdermal gels, hydrogel matrices, uh, and for peptides, a lot of parenteral formulations, including uh, prolonged release from in situ hydrogel forming peptides and oral dosage forms as well, different tablet formulations and nasal solutions. And for the proteins and, and MABs, mainly parenteral solutions or powder for reconstitution. And then for microbiome, it's NMOS and uh, also oral dosage forms in, in the pipeline. So rather complex picture uh, and a uh, lot of different challenges, which as a drug delivery scientist, you quite enjoy, uh, even if, if of course, uh, requires uh, that you have the competence, uh, core competences in drug delivery in-house. And uh, uh, I'll just bring the laser point out. Um, so you need to have the core competences in-house uh, within these different, uh, to be able to handle these different drug modalities. You need to have <clears throat> an organizational agility uh, and being a mid-sized pharmaceutical company, we need to have a product management uh, department that can handle different modalities uh, and also a discovery part of, of the organization that can handle different modalities. Now, regarding the drug delivery part, uh, we need to also have a learning agility within the organization and uh, curiosity didn't kill the cat. Curiosity is an essential tool for the, the drug delivery scientist to, to employ. Otherwise, there will be no in-house drug delivery innovation. And we strive to uh, be innovative in-house as most other companies, but to further increase the 
both the competence and the innovative skills. We also have collaborations with uh, both research drug delivery research consortium, such as Sweet Deliver, which is former the Swedish Drug Delivery Forum, and uh, the next Bioform. Both these consist of a range of, of different uh, companies as well as uh, universities. So it's a really interesting combination. We also, of course, have collaborations with the uh, University of Copenhagen uh, and other universities. Then we collaborate with different uh, CROs, different drug delivery technology companies. And a few examples of such collaborations are uh, could be the quite diverse uh, examples given here on the screen. The injectable controlled release microparticulate systems with all rice or oral nanotechnology delivery of peptides with ASHA in, in Brazil, or oral delivery of peptides with Enteris Biopharma in the US. Um, one thing that's actually employed uh, is an interesting collaboration with Roche, where we have individualized dosing of folytropine delta based on AMH biomarkers. So that's quite interesting. Now for the um, drug delivery technology scouting, actually all the uh, drug development scientists at Faring are scouts scouting for new drug delivery technologies. And we make a pre-assessment and an evaluation of the drug delivery technologies that either we scout out ourselves or are offered to us by different drug delivery technology companies. And the three main things that we do look at are the scientific rationale fit with the strategy and GMP potential. We really like that the, these technologies are possible to scale up and uh, manufacture with good reliability. Now, after this assessment, then we have a, a governance board, which will decide whether or not we will allocate resources for in vitro studies or non-clinical studies. And if those are successful, sorry, we'll move back here. Why, if I could move back, yeah. Uh, then we'll recommend that to the uh, therapeutic area heads and therapeutic uh, area organization for approval to move into projects. I'll also give one example uh, on a modality dependent developability assessment uh, process that we have. And this is the developability assessment process for peptides. So the two main things we look at is the chemical stability, and of course the solubility, and then it's the kinetic solubility I'm referring to, and especially the radiation propensity of the peptides. There we usually run a uh, short and uh, uh, try to have an efficient program, checking the aqueous solubility, effect of pH, buffer and excipients on the kinetic solubility, and also the effect of stress conditions. This in combination with the concentration at the dose that uh, we aim for will lead us to either go for a ready to use solution, which is the preferred option, or to a free stride powder for reconstitution. Um, this is a quite interesting field. Uh, and um, just to recap the, the message here, Ferrin has built organizations to handle different modalities with a rather slim uh, organization being a mid-sized uh, biopharmaceutical company and we are a learning organization and the key factor to success is to have experts within drug delivery and manufacturing in-house and uh, I'd like to thank my colleagues and the department of product development and drug delivery thank you for your attention Thank you, Andreas. This was very, very impressive, uh, I think, coming from uh, what you refer to as a mid-size pharma uh, to have all this. I, I am very interested in, in the knowledge transfer that must go on in this uh, beautiful house. Uh, also generous of you to, uh, to show us the criteria for, for the new technologies. I think there could be a lot of people in the audience who appreciate that and how they can uh, communicate with you in an easier way, knowing what you are looking for. So thank you so much, uh, Andreas, for this. Thank you, Anna. Now uh, we're turning to the next speaker. Uh, and uh, this person is from Camurus. And it's a company that has both grown and developed in a quite fascinating way. 
From the findings of cubosomes in classical phase diagrams um, to both providing a drug delivery technology to others and bringing their own products to the market. So I'm very excited to invite our next speaker, Nils Uwe Gustafsson, Vice President for Late Stage Development at Camurus. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Anna. Uh, and uh, thank you also, uh, Petter and, and Sophia, for, for uh, allowing me to present today. Um, let's see if I can manage the screen sharing. Here we are. We see it. So please. You see it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, during this 10 minutes of or eight minutes now uh, presentation, I hope to manage to give you all a, a small company presentation of uh, Camurus, uh, a quick overview of our drug delivery platform at Camurus. Um, and some of the major challenges that we, we have faced uh, during the development of our first uh, commercial drug product. And finally, a take home message for, for uh, hopefully all of you. Um, as Anna mentioned, uh, Camero started out uh, early on in 1991 uh, in Lund, um, and it was focused based on research that was performed in uh, on Lund University and uh, Lund's Technical Home School. Uh, around lipid structures. Uh, late 2018, we have our first uh, pharmaceutical drug product um, based on a, a proprietary uh, drug delivery technology approved uh, in Europe and Australia, and it was launched in January 2019. We are um, currently about 130 employees, making us to a uh, small mid-sized company, I guess. Uh, and we are listed on the Stockholm Stock Exchange. Um, so that's the short version of Camurus. Um, moving over to the, to the, the Fluid Crystal drug delivery platform that we have developed and now commercialized, I will actually ask uh, Unatin to take over here and actually show a video of, that will summarize in a very quick and efficient way, much more quicker and efficient than I can do uh, about this drug delivery platform. So please. Fluid crystal injection depot technology comprises a lipid-based liquid containing a dissolved active pharmaceutical ingredient. This formulation is easily dosed as a small volume injection into the subcutaneous tissue using a pre-filled syringe with a thin needle. Aqueous fluids in the tissue immediately transform the liquid into a highly viscous liquid crystalline gel-like depot, which encapsulates the active pharmaceutical ingredients. Naturally occurring enzymes in the tissue slowly degrade the depot. As it degrades, the active pharmaceutical ingredient is released. The formulation's lipid composition controls the rate of degradation from several days to weeks or months. Thus, a therapeutic dose of the active pharmaceutical ingredient is delivered over a prolonged period of time. Fluid Crystal Injection Depot Based on natural lipids Long-acting drug release over weeks or months Even therapeutic levels without frequent peaks and troughs Aims to improve treatment adherence Easy, convenient, and flexible administration using pre-filled syringes. Small injection volume with a thin needle. Manufacturing by standard processes. Yes, thank you. Um, so that was a quick overview of uh, the fluid crystal um, drug delivery technology, uh, which uh, we have now brought from early research uh, over to commercial product. But again, this wasn't a very easy process. Um, uh, touching on some of the problems and challenges that we did face uh, during this development. And I would need to point out that this is from a CMC perspective, which is the area where I work on. There might have been problems of uh, clinical um, things 
setting up a sales organization and things like that. But I, I take this as from a CMC perspective. Uh, one of the main challenges uh, that we faced was that it actually is a novel drug delivery system, and it's from the regulatory bodies, it's uh, it's totally new. Um, we got a lot of questions, of course, uh, some some good questions and some um, perhaps not the smartest questions around the the, um, the system as such. And since it was a quite a, a novel system, we were also forced into some some regulatory guidelines that is not really um, for parental products. We, we did have to comply with the regulation for, for uh, in vitro release for, for oral drug products uh, that we were forced into, for example. And that, that was uh, in some respects quite challenges. Um, one of the, the substances we have uh, in, in one of the lipids is regarded or was regarded as a new excipient. That was, of course, uh, brought some additional work to be able to, to introduce that. Uh, in our case, as you heard in the in the in the video, um, it's a quite simple product. It's a solution, uh, but um, we encountered some, some um, surprises when it came to primary packaging. We did much of the development work using simple wires, but in the end it was, uh, we, we used a pre-filled syringe and uh, that, that switch from one primary package to another created some, um, some surprises also that we uh, haven't, didn't have thought about from the beginning. Uh, even with, with such a, a simple process as, as we have for this formulation, it's more or less mixing the, the, the APIs and the excipients, uh, sterile filter, and fill it um, aseptically. Um, there were there is a lot of details uh, where the devil obviously are, uh, which we, we, was very 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 difficult to, to think in advance. Most um, aseptic manufacturing filling equipment is is um, made for um, aqueous solution of a, of a fairly low viscosity. Um, uh, in our case, it's uh, well be beyond the viscosity that that uh, to be as mentioned previously of Merck, Merck, um, and that causes a number of challenges. Uh, and some challenges is also dependent on the on the collaboration. We are we don't have our own manufacturing, so we're working with contract manufacturing organizations, and um, that might be uh, uh, quite challenging uh, in some respects, um, rewarding. Uh, in some, uh, we have worked with some CMO that is um, very good, and some that's not that good. Uh, I would say. So, so collaboration can be very fruitful, but it could also be, uh, in some cases, challenges uh, associated with it. Um, so in, uh, in brief, um, the, the take home message that I promised you, um, in this case, uh, as I've written, although there was many hurdles to overcome, um, Camuro is a small company with 60 dedicated employees managed actually to take a completely new drug delivery company or drug delivery technology all the way from idea to commercial product. And uh, the take home message is so can you. Uh, dedicated or dedication uh, gives results. And if it happens that you have a drug substance which you don't want to take the whole way uh, and you want a parental uh, drug delivery technology. Uh, uh, we might help you. I can tell you that. So, thanks, you. Thank you so much, uh, Nisa. And um, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for uh, adding a face diagram to your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also uh, thinking that maybe I will uh, highlight something for Petter. I think that it could be of uh, interest to uh, make sure that we engage regulatory experts and uh, authorities to these uh, discussions and networks, as it seems that uh, you know many of these things will be complex and the complex things need new solutions and new solutions need to um, be embraced uh, by uh, the regular authorities in a safe way. So. That could be one thing for collaborations. 
And now we've heard uh, a lot of interesting uh, science and development from uh, the different companies uh, in, uh, represented by our speakers. Of course, a lot of science and research and development is done at the academic institutions. And um, I think that perhaps the perspectives and problem statements there can be a bit uh, different and complement well the ones in industry. So we're gonna hear from two professors uh, in this last part of the speaker session. And the first one is uh, Professor Martin Malmsten, Director of Leo Foundation, a Center for Cutaneous Drug Delivery at University of Copenhagen. And I think we will hear more about this uh, center indeed. So welcome, Martin. Thank you, Anna. Uh, let's see if we can do this. Yes. We're good to go? You are good to go. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for the, for the opportunity to come here and, and, and uh, virtually to, to give a short presentation of, of uh, um, the Leo Foundation Center for Cutaneous Drug Delivery, which is a relatively recent uh, creature. It's been around, it's been alive for a, for a few years by now, uh, three years. Um, and, and really we set out to address this particular challenge. Uh, as I'm sure uh, all of you know, skin is a formidable challenge uh, for any drug uh, delivery um, product. I mean, it's, 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 it's one of the, the, the key features of this thing is just to keep water on the inside, pathogens and toxins on the outside and, and, and you know, strict control between inside and outside. So that it really makes <clears throat> delivery quite challenging generally speaking, but, but certainly so when you talk about larger drugs, hydrophilic drugs like biologics, if you, if you look at drugs that are lower potencies, you need relatively high concentrations, and particularly so if you also need to go a bit deeper into or through the skin that it becomes really quite difficult. So difficult, I would say that, that in the last couple of decades, uh, much of the progress uh, has actually been uh, in the device area where you basically applied brute force in a way to either drive drugs through the, that barrier through electric field, for instance, or you basically make uh, puncture holes uh, in the whole thing, whether you apply heat or micro needles or ultrasounds, but that's a way of opening up that barrier, so to say. Um, and, 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 and those have made wonderful uh, progress in, in many ways, uh, but as, as all technologies, they also have some limitations. Uh, some require healthcare professionals, uh, not easy to uh, apply yourself, so to say. Uh, and certainly uh, quite a few of them uh, suffer from challenges when it comes to surface area limitations. So let's say full body indications or near to full body indications like, like AD or, or uh, 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 atopodermal types of psoriasis could be difficult to challenge. So there still is a need for, for delivery systems uh, here. And, and this is the field of ointments and creams, if you like. And, 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 uh, but there has been a lot of progress, I would say, in the last couple of decades in material science in general and, and, and ways to investigate those. And, and we really set out in an attempt to try to um, benefit from those uh, developments to try to do something new in terms of cutaneous drug delivery. So basically what we, what we are is, is a physical, we try to be a physical chemical center essentially, uh, but as you will hear, we are embedded in, in the department of, of pharmacy. So, so clearly the you know, physical chemical slash pharmaceutics, but where we really want to try to be a bit more ambitious and optimistic, uh, naive if you like, when it comes to new materials and try to, to, to not only play it uh, safe, but to, to be on that forefront, trying out new materials and, and technologies uh, and see how far they can take us there. We have to realize that we're building on a 10-year um, funding base uh, from the Leo Foundation, from, uh, Leo Foundation, as well as the University of Copenhagen. So this is a summary of some strategies we set up three and a half years ago at our inauguration. Uh, and a couple of key features that that we wanted to that I want to stress. One is that we 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 went for a model where we are fully embedded as a department of pharmacy, and that is is really quite important because it means that we can benefit from all that expertise and infrastructure and methodologies that that is applied to um, other routes of administration, other types of delivery systems. 
but as I said, we wanted to uh, embrace developments in, in new materials and new ways of, of looking at those, analyzing those, uh, as well as uh, putting that in a biological context. Being in Copenhagen, uh, we also set out uh, from day one, we wanted to have, uh, we wanted to link resources uh, between Copenhagen and, and uh, uh, Lund and Malmö in particular. Uh, I'll come back to that briefly. Um, I mean, primarily it was in relation to the new facilities coming up there, but, but, but on the shorter term, it was tying up to particularly the physical chemistry going on on, 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 on the Swedish side, so to say. And then, uh, since one cannot only do uh, one can only do uh, so much with the resources that one has, uh, we wanted to have depth in the physical chemistry and the material science that we're doing. But of course, drug delivery is inherently a translational discipline, which means that we will it will have to come to both uh, preclinical and clinical collaborations as well as the industrial development context. We're not uh, a fundamental science as such, so to say. So those are development uh, or the collaborations aspect that, that that were highlighted at day one, so to say. So we set out to, to do that. We started with an empty lab, pretty much. No people and an empty lab three and a half years ago. Uh, and so we've been busy uh, getting some resources up for that. And, and uh, here are what we have now, both in terms of physical chemistry, We've added some, so we've really established quite a strong laboratory there, but also adding features when it comes to the pharmaceutical and biological aspects that we are contributing to the department of, of pharmacy. So, to say. so this is who we are uh, at the moment. And I particularly want to uh, draw your attention to the left uh, three uh, young ladies at the middle row. So Andrea Heinz, Maria van der Plaas and Catherine Brown. These are tenure track assistants and associate professors. And we're using we're building the center pretty much around those tenure tracks and, and adding them both postdocs, PhD students, as well as mentoring uh, at the sort of senior professor level to try to, to in, in, in a simple way, build an organization rather than to build a project. So, so our perspective is long term here. Um, so what we have been busy with uh, is, as I said, uh, setting up the whole thing. Uh, has taken us into the wonderful and weird world of admin in, at the universities, uh, getting some more money, uh, publishing on our research. And importantly, we've also been, uh, full embedment also means that we're quite um, active in teaching. So, so that is an important contribution we think also to the drug delivery field is training of our students to uh, have an experience in the cutaneous drug delivery area. So we're contributing more than 1700 hours per year to that, for instance. And, uh, we try to get that in, squeeze it in uh, pretty much wherever we can uh, in the curriculum, uh, as well as to do different projects with, with students. In terms of research, where we have focused so far is, is looking at the upper left side. Uh, we have spent quite some time on trying to sort of deconstruct and reconstruct uh, lipids. So that's basically the, uh, the, the stratum corneum barrier try to understand how structure and composition links together and how that translates into permeability. That has also translated into uh, preparation, uh, uh, preparative chromatography and things like that for new lipids because they are not commercially available, so to say, as well as development of methods for investigating these sort of complex structures. We have investigated both colloidal scale and sca uh, of delivery systems as well as scaffold. Uh, types of, of tissues, like uh, if you like, as well as putting that in um, in contact, let's say, with biological questions, particularly within the area of infection inflammation. So that is where the, the limitation of the center lies in terms of, of indications. We, we, we are focused on, on inf infection inflammation diseases primarily. Moving forward, where are we looking? Uh, we think that of the, for the system or for the for being a center of the type that we are with the physical chemical profile, we think that we, we really would like to have a go at this oh, oh, you know, towering challenge of the barrier itself, so to say. So we, we try to put together a concerted effort here and really take all the, the weapons that we have as this chem uh, to, 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 to push that boundary, whether that is really maximizing the driving force or different tricks of the trade uh, through facilitating the exchange between delivery systems and uh, skin lipids in the stratum corneum, to maximizing the, the um, uh, 
um, surface area contact of this sort of convoluted skin as well as maximizing occlusion or to trigger the responsiveness to, 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 uh, to achieve these things. Ultimately, of course, aiming to, to getting more drugs deeper into the skin for biological effect. Final slide, collaborations. Uh, why are we looking at collaborations? Uh, well, as I tried to say initially, we, we try to be, uh, we try to embrace the, the, the novelties of material science and physical chemistry in uh, drug delivery, which means that we need to spend more time there uh, than, than uh, uh, traditionally done in, in the say pharma uh, type of academic uh, environment. But since we need the translation dimension, we, we cannot do everything. We're only 10 plus people, 50 maybe. Uh, so by, by being immersed or in, in the, at the Department of Pharmacy and as well as the health uh, faculty, uh, Copenhagen, we do get access to complementary uh, skills and, and uh, uh, instrumentations. And, and when we go beyond, apart from the Orison region and the Max4 ESS or FISCHEM, uh, collaborations I mentioned, we are looking for selected uh, collaborations when it comes to specific materials and methods to, to characterize those and specific, a little bit more advanced issues related to skin and wound biology and in infection inflammation, which is further than what we can achieve, so to say. So really it, it is to access complementary expertise, but ultimately allowing them to us to focus on our own stuff, so to say. Now, Apart from this sort of academic collaborations, we, we of course always, uh, also have an interest and also we have a couple of ongoing uh, collaborations with industry. And this is certainly something we would like to explore uh, a lot more as, as during the coming years. So if any of that makes sense to you, uh, or if you'd like to hear more, we'll have that repeated in a more coherent way, um, just contact us and we'll be happy to, to discuss further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, I don't know, I, I feel impressed by each and every one of you and uh, this time by the holistic perspective and also the long-term perspective uh, of this center. Uh, it's not just a project, that's, that's very clear. So um, really interesting and, and good luck uh, now when you have the lab to go Thank beyond that, beyond the administration. Right. And now I turn to uh, the final speaker in this uh, session, which is Professor Johan Engblom. So we'll see if you will also um, impress. And uh, well, I'm quite sure you will because you're representing uh, Malmö University and uh, Biofilms, the research center for biointerfaces, which I know is also very impressive. And we already see your slides, so welcome. Um, so, I just need to start the video too, I guess. So, thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks a lot for allowing me, allowing me to speak here. Um, I, I intend to, to say a few words about our one of our most recent projects uh, at Malmö University and also one of the bigger ones called Biobarriers Health Disorders and Healing. It started just before the COVID situation hit us and we managed to have the kickoff physically. And then we went virtual in, in interactions with, with the different partners. Uh, I will come back to this in, in a little while. Uh, I will just see here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, hard to know when you have two screen, screens, uh, which one is showing. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to start from uh, 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 a couple of years back in time. Uh, we work from our uh, research center, uh, Biofilms Research Center for Biointerfaces, which, which was established already in 2005 based on a grant from the Knowledge Foundation that Thomas Arnebant acquired. And um, over the years, we have developed the center and, and now it's uh, 
inserted into the university uh, uh, system and, and a very valuable trademark for us, I would say. Uh, the vision is to, to shape novel solutions for improved health through excellent science in partnership with industry. And industry ex is extremely important for us. And as, as you can see to the left here, we, we are quite some people. We are 12 professors. We are 16 associate professors, lecturers, and about 44 postdocs and PhD students. We also have more than 55 industry partners in, in the center and has had uh, that for, for a long time. So I think we have learned over the years how, how to interact between academia and industry. And we are, I'm not saying that we are perfect, but we are getting better and better and better. And, and we have the formalities in place to, to facilitate uh, um, fruitful collaborations. Uh, the director of the center is uh, now is Therese Nordstrom, as Thomas have moved upwards, and he is now the pro vice chancellor for research at the university. So next, <laughs> second in line, if you say like that. Um, the center is, is covering three different areas. That is smart materials at interfaces, bio barriers and pharmaceutical design and, and biofilms, meaning both uh, molecular and, and um, microbial biofilms at interfaces. We also have a uh, initiative called Open Lab, meaning that uh, industry as well as academics might may come to us and, and use our equipment if if, uh, if they need to so that is a service or an asset that we happily share with you uh, of course there might be some some fees <laughs> attributed to that uh, bio barriers, health disorders, and healing. Then, well, that is also a so-called profile grant from from the Knowledge Foundation, the same as the one that initiated uh, the research center. It's the third uh, grant that we have managed to, to attract to Malmo University, and it's also the largest one with a total budget of 123 million Swedish, which is quite a lot. Uh, we have started with 13 industry partners and, and there is room for more. So if you're interested in joining, you are very welcome to, to contact us. And the, the ultimate goal here is, is to improve health and healing of biological barriers, meaning both skin as well as different types of mucosa. And, uh, and as you see down here in this corner, um, I'm not running this myself, but I have very important help from Professor Taut Gudas Ruskas and uh, Dr. Therese Nordstrom, also the head for or the director for the center. So it's a very, very good match there. Uh, the overall problem that we have identified is that there is a, a common picture missing of biobarriers, health disorders, and healing. And uh, we need that picture to, to help us to develop good products for specific conditions. If you come from this, the area where both Martin and I come from, uh, from the physical chemistry side, uh, if someone says skin, then you more or less immediately think about the brick and mortar model uh, describing the, the main barrier of the skin, stotum corneum. And the brick and mortar model was marketed by, by Professor Elias in uh, 1983, although he was not the first one uh, creating this model. But, but the interesting thing here is that more than 30 years later, he comes back and says, it's too early to conclude that we understand the structural basis of the permeability barrier completely. So there's more to do, but there is also a different side of skin research, and that is the clinical side. And I, I learned uh, quite recently that even though a skin condition looked very similar uh, in two patients, they can origin from completely different things and, and should be treated differently and, and so forth. And that, that was new to me as a chemist. It's also very frightening to see that the diabetic foot with a very small ulcer that you, uh, like you have here very rapidly can uh, develop into uh, the need for amputation. So it's very important to, to understand what's behind this and also how we can treat it, of course. And we have a strong belief that if we can marry these two parts and work together, then we will achieve much better results. So that, that's the whole uh, setting point for the new project that we now have started. 
It is a fairly big project with lots of partners, also lots of academics and, and uh, outreach to, to, to uh, other universities too. So um, it's not only industry collaboration here, but uh, of course we, we need to address or uh, attract clinics and stuff to, to really get this going. What we have done to, to facilitate um, production is that we have created a toolbox represented by these blue bars or the blue headlines here covering different aspects of skin research, uh, such as sustainable formulations, um, looking at film formulation on, on their properties, for example, uh, broken barriers, simulating molecular and biological processes, ex vivo models, culturing skin, uh, microbiota, promote and limit uh, microorganisms um, forming biofilms, as well as sensing and, and um, uh, using different devices to, to uh, sense, for example, bacterial mon monitoring here. We also have them uh, try to uh, make a matrix organization where we say education. Education is important for us and it's important for us to, to insert students into our research activities and, and allow them to meet industry partners and real challenges or, or real problems because uh, in, in academia, you can work with anything you get funding for, but uh, to, to really assess whether it's relevant or not, uh, uh, that, that process is much better accomplished if, if you have collaboration with, with the industry. Uh, and then we have clinical applications here, which is both understanding and helping the patient, as well as monitoring the clinical situation. And we have as currently working with the, we are working with uh, diabetics uh, patients and also patients suffering from incontinence and the skin problems they they have. Uh, operations are mainly run uh, through sub project meetings, so monthly sub project meetings is recommended. But the, each of these teams can decide for themselves how how they would like to do it. We also have a couple of larger meetings where all partners meet uh, each year. And we have, of course, a board and we plan on, on a conference annually. Uh, the chairman of the board is uh, from industry and that's Dr. Costas Caravellas at uh, Bioglen. We also have, um, I see my time is probably running out here. <laughs> uh, we also have um, quarterly reports, uh, one slide per sub project to um, for, for, for communicating to, to everyone what's going on in the different products. I have a couple of, of examples here with, with references uh, showing what we are doing. Um, I suggest that those of you who are interested can have a look later and you e can easily find the, the different papers and, and read more. Uh, and then I will just jump these and come to well, I would like to say a little bit about this slide. We have lots of industry collaboration. It's often several companies in, in, um, together in the projects, but there are also occasions where uh, companies are, are keen on a one-to-one -one collaboration uh, because they have maybe a specific thing they are interested in. And of course we can do that too. The only condition that we have for such collaboration is that we are allowed to publish what we do together. So there has to be a publication that is our product. So here are just three, three examples, uh, also with some Danish collaboration. My final slide is here. Uh, my, my ambition with, with this uh, Biobarriers Health Disorders and Healing project is that we should use that as a leverage to create a strong hub in Scandinavia for transdermal drug delivery and, and all uh, related uh, symptoms that, that comes with skin and, and mucosa. Um, we should have a common vision for, for biobarriers, health disorders and healing, and it should be based on university industry clinics collaboration. Um, we have some collaboration already. Martin and I have discussed before the COVID situation how to facilitate the, the Swedish-Danish uh, um, synergy that, that is obviously there. Uh, unfortunately, the meeting that we plan to have had to be cancelled uh, due to the current situation. Uh, but, but there is an ambition on this. 
Um, I would also like to say that, of course, we are on bike distance from MAX4 and ASS. And as you see here, we have a brand new um, X-ray machine in house. So why not come first to Malmo and then go to MAX4 and do, do your experiments? And if you're interested in anything of this, you could enter into the BioBarriers project, or you could also perhaps enter into our research school with the, where we take in a new uh, bunch of the PhD students, or we can discuss other potential initiatives that, that could be in, of interest to you. So I stop there and uh, sorry for dragging over a little bit, Anna. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Johan. And uh, this is actually a very good slide uh, to finish up uh, the speaker session with. And it will bring us over to the uh, panel and the discussion that we're going to have about uh, different ways and aspects of collaboration. So I ask all the uh, speakers who have done a really, really good job. Thank you very much. Uh, you've painted a nice picture of this very interesting area. And if you all now have turned on your microphones, um, we're gonna spend a couple of minutes discussing. Uh, I have received um, some questions from, uh, from the audience. Thank you very much for the engaged audience. Um, and I have made some myself. And I'm starting uh, turning to uh, the representatives of the large and mid-sized pharma. So Ferring and AstraZeneca. I'm turning to you, to Jonas and um, uh, Andreas. Uh, you spoke about great possibilities and about um, a positive vision, of course, of all the things that can be done. But I want to challenge you and uh, ask, where are you now? On what frontiers are you standing and feeling that this is where you need help? This is where you want to develop and that you see that uh, you really want to take a step further with uh, a collaboration with all the modalities and with all the different administration routes uh, which ones are the ones where you think this is where I will reach out over the sound or to someone would uh, you want care to start perhaps okay I think uh, you have just posed an impossible question because there are so many new uh, uh, treatment modalities coming up so it's it's really impossible to say which one. I think the, the the situation where we want to be in is really that we have a large range of different uh, uh, drug delivery solutions uh, for each uh, uh, new medicine that we we want to, to go for. Um, so I I really don't want to to highlight any any particular one. But uh, in fact, on it actually, I want to change that subject a little bit because I I think it's not just about the ready solution. I think we mustn't also forget about the skills needed. So, so we we have skills for the traditional uh, 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 traditional skills like uh, pharmaceuticals and and uh, or pharmaceutics and uh, analytical chemistry and uh, physical chemistry and that sort of thing. But we also see that we we need more competence in in uh, biochemistry and and biomedicine and and biology. And in particular, we need the combined skills of those people that understand both of these fields to, to do something. So let's not forget about the skill part. So, so reaching out to our university friends, I think is very important. Very important, thank you. And also important for the recruitment to, uh, to the region Absolutely. and the, the area. Absolutely. Yes. And Andreas, do you have any other comments on, on, on this then impossible and question or? Well, I, um, I think I have two two comments, and one is that uh, part of this um, is addressed by, for instance, by by Farin, together with um, ten or what are we, fifteen or sixteen other companies are engaged in in Sweet Deliver. Um, AstraZeneca is, is uh, one of the companies as well, and uh, the interaction there between the companies and uh, the University of Uppsala enables us to to both uh, be part of, of uh, basic fundamental research, uh, but it is basic and fundamental research uh, with an eye and, and a view on the drug delivery questions that uh, we face at the different uh, companies. So I think that's a very good uh, meeting ground for uh, putting forth the, the interesting questions regarding 
different modalities and, and, and different uh, dosage forms as, as well. So I think that's a good, uh, very good meeting ground. And I think we are actually learning a lot, both from the companies and, and the universities. And uh, they might also be the feeding ground for bilateral collaborations in the future. So I think that is one good aspect. Mm -hmm. Uh, if Helene Schögren was, was here, she would talk more about next bioform, of course, uh, which has a bit more the larger molecules uh, that uh, is of interest to, to Faring. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, personally, I, I would like to see more collaboration uh, between the companies, but where you uh, don't, uh, where you're not competitors in, in the different therapeutic areas, but uh, to have collaborations around the, the drug delivery systems. Because I think we are moving towards uh, more and more complex uh, knowledge required. And uh, as Jonas pointed to multidisciplinary teams with uh, uh, a range of different specialities that needs to come together to really have um, excellent drug delivery propositions. Yes, yeah. You, I think mentioned uh, one of those, you, you work with uh, several different companies and Roche included. Uh, and then, uh, but you have both mentioned the academics. So I, I turn then to, for example, Martin Malmsten. Um, when you collaborate with, uh, with industry and you were asking uh, for more of that, um, what is in it for you? What, what is it that you feel that you want to um, uh, get? What's the top three things? Hello. <laughs> You're geared up with impossible questions. No, but I mean, it, it, it depends entirely on the situation. I think one, one really needs to separate and, and, and find out in, 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 in the relationship of where one, what one wants to achieve, so to say, if, if the aim is to, to, to build, if the, if the perspective is long term to build sort of pre-competitive knowledge base, uh, then, then that is, of course, something that is well suited for PhD or, or, or postdoc projects and things like that. And then there are certain frameworks that come out of that and things that are attractive for us apart from the, you know, the, the knowledge input, the, the possibility of output in terms of, of students that can be recruited and also publications. But uh, we also, uh, I mean, we, we recently uh, started Center in that respect. So we're not that impressive as, as you once group uh, yet, but um, in terms of, of shorter term, th th there could also be this, this other way of interacting, and that is to, to, to I mean, we are involved in, let's say, a small startup, for instance, where the issue is to, to develop, uh, setting up a, a basically an, an early R&D uh, pipeline, so to say, to, to lead up to the preclinical package first and then the clinical trial. Then, of course, it's a, it's a completely different uh, set of conditions and, and our motivation as universities is, 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 is primarily uh, uh, in, in terms of, of, you know, getting information and knowledge of where the field is, is currently at the forefront, but, but also uh, for, for our, let's say, members of staff who have that inclination, young postdocs or PhD students who really wants to become involved in, in entrepreneurship, that could be an attractive feature for them as well. So it, it's a mixed bag. It depends entirely on the situation, I would say. I think that's fine. You can have a mixed bag. Uh, I think what's important for collaborations is that the different stakes and, and um, uh, reasons for engagements mm. are discussed and that's yes. the, the best uh, uh, founding for for a good collaboration so i'm i'm, I'm grateful for uh, your generosity in, in in talking about these things um we don't have so much uh, time for uh, discussion left um but what i hear is that you're all uh, you really are, i mean you're in favor of drug delivery as an important field uh, it is one of the ways to to solve many of the unmet needs and uh, the uh, the situations that a lot of patients are in so that's clear it also seems like there is a, a lot of um, uh, good uh, experts and, and companies and uh, collaborations already going on in this region but I, I still want to see if you know, can anything more be done. Um, could we have like a, a big center 
for for drug delivery can this can this region and this area be a beacon for for such um, such a development uh, are we um, good enough is there a good enough potential what is missing um, is there an interest in in having a more formalized way of of working um, what do you think is there any comments from from anyone in uh, in the panel or I can direct my questions. I, I would say, of course we are, yeah. <laughs> but, but maybe that's a bit naive, but I think it's good to have a very uh, high ambition for, for what would, you would like to do. And, and uh, if you reach halfway, then fine. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that uh, maybe it could make it easier with recruitments and, and, uh, and easier also to get this inflow of, of new competences uh, needed. Um, if we uh, if we if we could speak about it in such a way that we had a let's say a, a, a drug delivery center or something like that. What That's do you think, Nicolas, who is uh, speaking for um, the SDDIG, and you're talking about the uh, the increased awareness of? I think we have just uh, started on that journey. So we have had uh, we have this uh, session today, and and. Um, and you mentioned, uh, Anna, you mentioned that there's the session we were at uh, that was um, delivered by Sweden Bio together with the California uh, Life Science uh, Network. And I think we are starting to see these things happen, collaboration um, across our different networks. And I think this, if we can do a little bit more of this, then that can gravitate into something that can become this, uh, if, if, I'm not sure what to call it if it's it's not a super center but it's it's a it's a, a hub for for this entire region i think that would be fantastic mm -hmm. thank you yeah, i'd like to comment as well that, that uh, i think also it's a, it's a good uh, uh, idea to, to aim for a drug delivery center uh, in uh, in this region of, of sweden denmark of course uh, but it needs to be have a specific focus to have critical mass to actually uh, mean something both in terms of fundamental science and also to be able to apply that uh, fundamental science. Mm. Yeah. So though, um, of course, needs to be done um, to think about this. But I'm so, so grateful. Thank you all for your contributions. Uh, I think... I, I can only speak for myself, but I have really enjoyed uh, these um, these uh, talks that you've been given. And um, I will not be able to hear from everybody who's been on Vimeo, but at least we will be able to hear from uh, two of the organizers. So um, I ask uh, Peter to uh, join in now again, and also Jörn Mars from Merck Group. Uh, and we will hear their final remarks from, from this session. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe I should start, Anna. I would also like to thank everyone, of course, for uh, joining us today. Uh, a special thank to the <clears throat> speakers and to you, Anna, for doing a fantastic job as, as a moderator, as always. Uh, I will bring with me that uh, there seems to be a big interest to continue to work on a collaboration across the sound, which I think is uh, sounds really good. And I can assure you that we at Medicon Valley Alliance will do our best to uh, explore that uh, in the future. Um, I would also like to apologize for the technical problems we had in the very beginning of this event. I hope you... Uh, uh, that you can bear with us. And, and I also look forward to uh, see you all soon again before I hand over uh, to the final words from, from Jörn and Jonas. Uh, thank you once again, Jonas and Jörn. Some very short final words. Our time is, is already up. So uh, over to you and thank you so much. In that case from me, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Petter and, and uh, Sofia for, for giving us this opportunity. And, and thanks, uh, especially thanks to Anna for a fantastic moderation of, of this event. Uh, it, it couldn't have been very easy. What I see here is a, a fantastic breadth of, of uh, drug delivery, but I also see some, some really interesting depth in this field. So um, I think main conclusion is to let's continue to, to network. And Jörn, maybe something from you. Yeah, I agree with you, Jonas. Uh, it has been a very good start on our journey, I would say, together, all of us. And, um, well, 
I hope that we will uh, have the next meeting rather soon. Thanks a lot for all of you. Thank you so much. And thank you for today, everyone.